G'day everyone and welcome to On The Outer. I'm Gus and I'm here with my co-host, Tom. Thank you, Gus. Yes, welcome to the show, everyone. Round four in the books, round five coming up uh, today or tomorrow, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, some pretty exciting matches coming up, but also a few upsets in round four, Gus. We'll get on to the, uh, the tipping later in the extra edition that we release every week. But uh, if you tipped eight or if you tipped nine this week, you're probably one of those people in the office tipping who does no idea what they're doing and just flukes it. Yeah, just throws darts at a ball Mm. because that's about as much chance as you got. Mm. Uh, We're going to have a quick chat about Gil McLaughlin's decision to resign at the end of the year and who might be up for replacing him. We're going to have a quick look at the uh, AFLW Grand Final as well because we haven't really touched on that competition yet this year, Tom, but we will have a look at that. Um, We're going to analyse our changing opinions of three teams that we had pretty high up in some cases and not as high up in other cases and and see where we're at with those. Um, We'll look at Paddy Ryder's suspension because we actually weren't going to do it, but it just seems that everybody disagrees with us. So mm. we thought we might get some content out of that. Disgraceful. Uh, yeah, then we're going to come in come in hot with some reverse shine of light as well uh, <laughs> to finish off the show, as we always do. Beautiful. Well, uh, as we say every week, please give us a follow and uh, a like on the Instagram and all it's, those social yeah. medias. And Oh, yeah, the YouTube. We've got... Um, YouTube channel now with all of our videos, all of our episodes coming up there. You can catch them in full. You can see our tipping shows as well. So if you're just listening, maybe give us a look and a a subscribe on YouTube because that uh, really helps us. All right, Tom, let's kick off the show, however, with uh, Gil McLaughlin, the big news out of, well, AFL HQ, that Mm -hmm. Gil McLaughlin will stand down uh, at the end of the season. He, I think he's done... I mean, his his legacy is defined by COVID, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, and everything else is kind of secondary to that, I suppose. Um, AFLW, obviously, is another part of his legacy. Some massive TV deals that he's managed to negotiate, and that's kind of how he got the job in the first place was mm. was his successes in that um, area. But what, he, what what to you was Gil McLaughlin's... I suppose, crowning achievement or or what will you remember about his time in charge? Yeah, so I think obviously COVID is the big one and I think you you can't really um, say anything other than they did really well through that period. Like just to get those two seasons completed was a really fantastic effort. Um, They got some help from the governments involved, particularly Queensland in 2020, to be able to shuttle players in and out when um, the general public wasn't afforded the same liberties. So they uh, got some help with it, but they certainly did a good job. And I think that Gil, um, you know, I think he was probably a good man for that job as well um, when that crisis came along. The AFLW is another huge uh, achievement, as you said, and I think that in the end they brought that forward by about three or four years, such was the groundswell of community support for it. And, um, you know, he was able to listen to that and respond accordingly and actually change the long-term plans the AFL had had and and to bring that competition in. So he got on him for that. It's still unfinished work though, because it's still semi-professional. I think that's a big thing. So yes, it's, it's, going and there will be 18 teams in the competition um, next season, which is great. Every team will, will be represented, but uh, still a bit of work to do getting the professionalism and the, the pay levels up to where they should be for that. Um, the TV thing you mentioned as well, like I, that, that is great what he's done and he's, that's a hugely important thing because it totally funds the game, but that was kind of happening anyway, wasn't it? Like these huge TV deals, they were just getting bigger and bigger by the year. So when he signed off on that billion dollar one, I think in 2016, um, which was the big sort of crowning achievement of his career up to that point, I strongly suspect that the figure would have been something similar to that no matter who was in charge because that was just the nature of the the moving industry at the time. Yeah, it's a fair point. I think um, I yeah would echo your sentiments about AFLW. Like it's great that it's happening, but it, it is still a work in progress, and I suppose um, mm. that's that needs to be acknowledged when talking about Gill's kind of uh, contribution to the game. I think the other big, I don't want to call it a miss because it's it, it's in process, but Tasmania um, and and the kind of I suppose unwillingness to engage with that issue more any more than sort of what he has done, which is very 
peripheral really like it, it's not a mm. there hasn't been a firm commitment any like in any way that's probably the big miss of his his time uh as afl um as the boss but i can it's also another, it's another work in progress isn't it it's yeah. like the aflw thing and there's another tv rights deal issue mm. so there's actually like three really big things big that he's things. worked on that yeah. aren't finished yet which is interesting it's interesting that he's resigning with those things sort of. And I mm. guess I just mean, I suppose, out of all of those things, like Tasmania is the least, like it's the, the least far, like far down, yeah. the, down yeah, the path. Totally. Um, yeah. The other yeah. thing I think that he'll be remembered for probably is the, is the biggest negative of his career was the, the whole Adam Good situation and mm. um, the lack of strength and fortitude in coming out and, you know, censoring that whole behaviour and, um, it did happen eventually, and there was an apology attached to it, but it was pretty weak. And yeah. for someone who, at least publicly, and you can only assume privately as well, is pretty well grounded when it comes to social issues and you know the 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 common man, despite the fact that he's a presumably one of the most wealthy dudes in the Victoria. Um, he clearly has you know a pretty good connection to that stuff, so that was really disappointing. And I think that he would be disappointed by that because that's probably the biggest black mark on his legacy was just that whole situation and his inability to diffuse it quickly enough. Yeah, and I suppose the other thing would be the Simon Lethlin situation as well um, and and how that mm. kind of played out, although I suppose that was dealt with a little bit better. Um, mm. All right, Tom, anything else you want to touch on with about Gil uh, specifically? Well, just just that I I you know I can't help but um but like him like I I find him very funny you know he's got a great sense of humour and he is able to know the situations to really play with that and um I remember the um like some of his performances on AFL three hundred and sixty over the years have been really funny like his ability to sort of you know tease Robbo tease Jared you know have them kind of have a go at him and it'll generating the right spirit and stuff. I've always really enjoyed uh, his media stuff. And that's not to say that he's a perfect individual or a perfect CEO, but I think he was very warm and easy to like. And it'd be interesting to see, we'll probably talk about now who's the candidates to take over. I don't see that there's anyone else really that can fill that side of it, uh, of the job. Yeah. Well, let's do that now. Let's uh, do a bit of speculation. I guess the mm. big, the biggest name that's been thrown up or the name that's been thrown up the most times is Brendan Gale. Mm. Uh, the current Richmond CEO um, or chairman or whatever the hell he is. Yeah, I, whatever. They, so, they yeah. all have different titles, but it all just mm. means the same thing. Um, he, he's obviously been put out because of his his success at Richmond, taking them from what was essentially a basket case, uh, briefly becoming good before plunging them back into crisis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so obviously his position, he... he Probably I think there's a sense that he has the job if he wants it. Um, and I I think it might might be a case more of does he actually want to leave Richmond and go to the AFL? Um, the other names obviously being tossed around, Travis Old from West Coast. Uh, there's uh, Xavier Clark was briefly mentioned, but I think that was probably more... Uh, last year than than this year he was given the opportunity to go to the afl he didn't do it mm. uh and then brad scott who obviously was given significant responsibilities at, at afl victoria uh and often can kind of he has done roles currently which have led into the afl ceo position um previously yeah yeah, well, uh, certainly Gail's name has been put up a few, and, and even when McLaughlin got the role, Gail was seen as a contender mm. then. Um, I don't know if I agree that if he wants it, it's his though, because there seems to be a bit of a, um, a willingness from the AFL to to look within a lot of the time. And if you hear, um, I've heard, you know, some, I read some snippets and heard some interviews with with Mick Warner, who wrote that book, The Boys Club, about the AFL, and there's a real sense that Gail is not um, someone that they want in the role at all because of his experience with the player association and then being with um, a, a club, um, they would much rather have someone from within the AFL who knows how things are done to continue to do things those way, that way, uh, which I think is, is a bad idea. Um, I think that they should be open to people from outside. And um, yeah, I think Travis Ald is the AFL man and he's certainly in the running for the job. And I think that um, potentially 
Gale would be considered like the outside candidate. So it could end up being one of those two. It could end up being a, a third person who, you know, can appeal to all parties. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like there's no one – there's not like a really obvious person like there was when Gill took over or no. um, when Demetrio took over from Wayne Jackson either. No, and, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think at least my read of it was that, but maybe I'm wrong. Mm. <clears throat> All right, Tom, let's move on. The AFLW Grand Final. Do you want to chuck out your ideas about that or your analysis of that game? Yeah, so in the end, like uh, Adelaide uh, crowned victors and uh, clearly one of the best, you know, sporting teams, certainly in the AFLW, um, that, you know, that we've seen in the last few years. There's some great, really strong, successful sporting teams, particularly in women's sport at the moment. Um, the cricket, you know, the, the um, limited overs cricket team being the main one. But Crows have now won three premierships. They've played in another grand final and they've had a final series cancelled on them. So it's an unbelievable um, period of success. And they have so many household names. I was looking through today, like their team, you got... Obviously, Chelsea Randall, Aaron Phillips, Anne Hatchard, Ebony Marinoff, like most of the players that um, people would know, probably outside of Daisy Pearce and maybe Taylor Harris, who also played in this game, funnily enough, um, are Adelaide players. It's been a remarkable period of success. And when the the men's side of the organisation has done so poorly as well, it's just mm. um, a phenomenal effort. So. Yeah, in the end, they win by 13 points. There was certainly some periods of momentum in the game where Melbourne looked like they were on top and probably couldn't quite capitalise. And then other times when, you know, Adelaide probably could have put them away and didn't quite capitalise. So in the end, it's, uh, it's a 29 to 16 scoreline, which is not a, a great score, um, even in, you know, AFLW in 2022. But, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful victory and a crowning achievement and, um Unfortunately for Daisy Pierce, she doesn't get the flag. She may go around next year. That's unclear. But Erin Phillips gets yet another one, and we don't know if she's going to be playing at, at Port Adelaide next year, which is a another big talking point as well. Yeah, there does seem to be a lot of uh, well, almost. I, w- I wouldn't say it's like a fait accompli, but there's, there's a lot of groundswell that Erin Phillips will finish off her career at Port Adelaide, and it's not that surprising, mm. like. For those who don't know, her dad is, you know, a Hall of Fame Port Adelaide player. Aaron Phillips was signed for Port Adelaide originally, um, was their, like, original marquee player before they didn't get an AFLW licence that went to Adelaide and then she went yep. and played for the Crows. So, yeah, I I would – look, I, I'm not going to say I'd be stunned if it didn't happen, but, you know, I think at this point it's sort of – there's a lot of 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 groundswell for her to be doing that, so it could well be her last game for the Crows. Um, and you know she's she is getting older as well, so she's um, she's probably pretty close to the end. I think Daisy Pierce. Well, who knows? There is talk because the the season has been moved up, like the dates have have been moved up. She may go around one more time just because of that. Like it's less time, um, but yeah, August. I think yeah, August again, is the next so. is the next season. Yeah. So that makes it a bit easier for her. But yeah, I, I think um, this could be the end of of a couple of, or well, not the end, but sort of the end of this chapter of a couple of potentially the two best AFLW players, or, or at least the two most hope like the two highest profile um, yeah. AFLW players. Yeah, I think significant for different reasons as well. Like Aaron Phillips has pretty clearly been the best player since the competition started, um, whereas Daisy Pierce's you know career leading up to that point, you could say had a big influence on the competition actually kicking off. You know, because sure, she was yeah. so dominant and uh, playing at such a high quality level, and all of it. You know, the whole Darabin Falcons. Uh, club and you know, continue to produce star players and coaches and everything. So, yeah, I, I think it's um, very appropriate. There's a bit of talk during the week, you know, when they eventually retire, rename the two main awards, best on ground in the in the grand final um, and the W, which is the Brownlow equivalent. So I think naming um, those two awards after those two players would be very, very fitting. Yeah, I agree. All right, Gus, we'll move on to um, our look at back at round four and um, some 
highly ranked teams had some you know interesting performances some good some bad some questionable uh, we thought we'd just look at some of the clubs and that we had kind of around the top end of the ladder and, and look at where they're standing now to see if we uh, feel the need to change that description I suppose we should probably start with the Bulldogs who right now sit um, one and three from their first four games they've lost to Melbourne Carlton and, and the Tigers Um I think that the issue with the Bulldogs, that to my mind, and there's probably more than one, but because they've loaded up so heavily in the midfield and they've got all their eggs in that one basket, that's a really, really good asset. But I feel like maybe that can only get you so far. So they're probably always going to be up there contending. Um, I don't know whether having all your eggs in one basket is enough to get you, you know, a premiership. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we discussed this when they made the Adam Trelaw move and it's not <clears throat> I think like there's a misconception sometimes about like like when they got Adam Drelaw it was so, for such a cheap price for what he is that like somehow that makes it okay because the trade was good but it's also the money that you're paying Adam Trelaw has to impact other parts of the ground like you can't just mm. go out and pay x and i think y. collingwood's paying a fair bit of it though they, they are paying i think they're paying like 150 or 200 thousand mm. or something that's right. still 700 grand that's going into adam out of the dog's cap so mm. <clears throat> yeah i mean i think you i think you're exactly right like you look at melbourne and the balance that they sort of have across their the ground and like even melbourne their forward line you would say like it's good, but it's not stuffed with stars. Whereas the rest mm. of their team is, you kind of can't have like, you can't be good everywhere. Like you can't have stars everywhere. Um, and, and in some places and some like kind of types of players, you just have to get away with being decent or, or and, and that's sort of how you win a premiership, right? Is that like those mm. decent players make a little leap during the season. Melbourne, we saw it with dudes like Jake Bowie and Charlie Spargo, those kind of guys. Like, they played well enough that you can win the premiership because your stars are good. Yep. I think you're right in saying there is that element to it. Um, obviously, the kicking for goal has been awful for weeks now, and that's, that's a serious mental issue. <clears throat> um, but I also just think, alongside that the stars actually aren't playing all that well for the dogs like no. i think i think you know we're seeing a little bit of a breakout year from bailey smith now he's one that is being that he is playing really well um jack mccray is still getting a lot of the footy and doing what he does um which is sort of like we can debate <laughs> how valuable that necessarily is all the time but yeah, um, but but even McRae, he's had seasons where he racks it up like he like he has been, and he's clearly all Australian level. This year, in the first five four yeah. games, anyway, you wouldn't have him anywhere near the all. Australian Well, that's the thing; team. he's just racking it up. Like it's yeah. not not anywhere near as damaging. Bontembelli was hurt, but he's still in the team, so you have to critique him on on what he is. Dunkley has not used the ball well. Like Dunkley has had a really good game two weeks ago where they won. Um, but he hasn't used the footy well. Liv has been put on the half forward line. Bailey Dale's kicking. Like, it's just a bunch of these players who who you would describe as being in their best six or eight players have just not played that well. And, I mean, I agree with you that I don't think that they can win the premiership as their team is currently constructed, like, as unbalanced as it is, particularly with no Josh Bruce. But they should still be good enough to beat like this Richmond team, this iteration of Richmond or or yeah. whatever. And it's because their top talent is just not like not playing that well, aside from Tim English and and Bailey Smith. Well, I think the point about the skills is like their skills aren't their kicking is deplorable. Like mm. even in front of goal is the obvious, you know, it's where you see it. But around the ground, their skills over the first four four weeks haven't been good. Um and uh, you know, we we talked about this start of the year, like teams that get smashed in grand finals. Mm. You look back through like GWS, Port, you know, Melbourne back in the late 80s, like these teams who got absolutely smashed by like 80 plus points in the grand final, they don't make finals the next year. Yeah. So the confidence just goes. Yeah. 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 And it's, uh, it's, I think that is an issue with the Bulldogs. I think they are, 
having a confidence issue. And I think playing Melbourne again in round one probably wasn't very helpful for them at all because no. they just got put straight back on their bums again. So. But you're right. Like, I mean, he, guys who you would consider Bailey Dale, Caleb Daniel, who are really good kicks, mm. they, they're turning the ball over at half back, like just missing kicks. Like, and, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I sort of, like you don't, I, I I look at like Josh Dunkley and he misses a few kicks and you're like, but that is just what Josh Dunkley is, you know, like yeah. you just have to put up with that if you want Josh Dunkley in your team for all the other things he does. But Bailey Dale, Caleb Daniel, Bont, McRae, they are yeah. in the team and they are stars and probably paid like stars, probably primarily because of their ability to use the ball. You know, I mean, like Bont is obviously a superstar in a, a multitude of ways, but his greatest asset is the fact that he can kick it 60 metres and land it on somebody's tit. You know, like yeah. that's that's how, that's what he's really, really exceptional at. And it just hasn't been happening. They've been missing like very easy kicks and it destroys them at times. All right. Well, before we move on, do you still expect them to play finals? Ooh. I don't know. I, like, my gut says no. I mean, they're one and three, like, and they, and those losses aren't. See, I, I, I base a lot of my opinion on like who you beat and who you lose to, right? Like, I mm. think it's very relevant and important. And those losses, I don't think are to particularly good teams, apart from Melbourne, obviously. So, mm. no, I don't think they're going to make finals. Okay, I think I still think they probably will, but they're t- I think top four is done now. Like, yeah, because they're they're, they're going to get in a roll like at some <laughs> point, and they'll probably get enough to sneak into the the eight. But top four, I wouldn't have thought. Um, all right, let's go look at the cats because they had a pretty impressive win on uh, Friday night at um, at what's it called GMHBA or yep. Cardinia Park uh, against a really good opponent in Brisbane. Yeah, so we sort of saw a. Uh, we talked about this, I think, last week or the week before with Geelong, and it's just that they have these stars that can turn up enough times. And that, and that's really been the question with Geelong. It's like, can these stars turn up enough times, stay healthy enough for them to be good again? And, like, at this stage, the answer is yes. Now, can that sustain for 25 weeks or 26 weeks or whatever it's going to take to win a premiership? I don't know. Mm. But we just saw Tom Hawkins. He's kicked five. Um, Isaac Smith's had 25, 28, 30 touches again and kicked a goal. Like these dudes who are good at football, like they are really, really good football players. The question remains still like, and obviously they are still getting this bump from GMHBA or, or Cardinia. Like they are still getting that. I think they'd be wrapped that they won this game with Tom Stewart and Joel Selwood not playing. Uh, that's that's just massive. Like getting a, a game where they both get a week off, even if Tom Stewart had gastro or whatever, um, had the poops. Uh, he, it's just huge for them because they get to actually give those guys a rest. The fact that Joel Selwood had to be managed round four <laughs> is also is probably not. Great, but look, <clears throat> I also just think like Geelong, uh, the team, I think most of all, and maybe with Richmond potentially, we're just going to have to wait and see a little bit because I think I, I think that they will be fine at the start of the year. It's when the season gets a bit deeper and mm. the older bodies start, are they going to wear down more than what we've seen and the injuries start coming in? Like that's... That's the question for me. Yeah, I think that the other thing that with the Cats, um, well, so first on a positive note, like you, you mentioned those stars they've got. I also thought, you know, Parfit and um, uh, Holmes have had really good starts to the season. They both look pretty well established as part of that midfield now and certainly you would hope Parfit would be, but, but Holmes I think is tracking really nicely. He's regularly getting sort of up towards 20 touches a game, which is good. Um, but, yeah, I still just – do question the the midfield a little bit. I know they beat Brisbane on, on the weekend and that was a really fantastic win. But, um, yeah, to see how they go up against, say, you know, the Melbourne midfield on the MCG, 
um, Brisbane at the Gabba, you know, those kind of like really strong midfields, even the dogs at, at Docklands. Like I just think the depth quite isn't quite there and we'll see whether these guys like Holmes and Parfit, who I mentioned, and even Narkel can actually – they need to improve, I think, significantly over the course of the year. Um, if their level that they're expecting now or they're getting now is still the level that they are expecting in the finals, then that's probably – the main question mark for me. But, yeah, they're doing really well, um, and they've certainly surpassed my expectations. Just to jump in there, Tom, um, mm. we, we had a comment on our, our tipping video last week from Matt Shaw. Uh, mm-hmm. He says, great tipping, gents. Agree with pretty much everything except Geelong. Our midfield are great, and we will win because go Cats. So there you go. Story. that up here. Shaw sure, dog. Well done. Well done, Matt. Um yeah, all right. Uh, last one was the Swans, Gus. Um, mm. They got a, away with it, got out of jail, you could say, against North Melbourne. But they've had a couple of weeks in a row now where they haven't looked quite as exciting as they did in the first two weeks. Um, are you starting to question where you see the Swans? Are they still a sort of top four, top six, you know, contending side for you? I think so. I, I was – look, I am – We've had this conversation before about Mills and Heaney and like their midfield rotations, right? And like we've discussed the Sydney midfield rotations, it feels like a million mm. times on this podcast. I was pretty confused when, you know, that game was getting pretty close to the death and and Ollie Florent was running around taking like at the centre bounce and, and Luke Parker was parked in the forward pocket. Like as much as I appreciate that you have to rotate your midfield and start blooding new players, Luke Parker's 29. He's averaged 28 touches last season. He's one of the best inside players in the competition and the game's there to be won and you're sticking Ollie Florent who, I mean, really Ollie Florent has shown more ability on the outside than anything as a midfielder. I don't know. I, I just think... I just think he does, like, Longmire, at times I wonder if he's getting close to the Bevo school and just, like, doing weird stuff sometimes just for the sake of it. Yeah, he's 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 totally in that. Remember when he refused to play Tom Mitchell despite him yeah. getting about 1,000 possessions in the... 65 touches in, the in three quarters and he <laughs> and couldn't he get a game. Yeah. And wins a yeah. Um, I, look, I think you're right, but I think that kind of t- ties into what I think about the Swans, which is that I don't reckon this is their year, and I think Longmire probably is looking more towards contending for a flag in, say, two years, and that's why you would have someone like Florent in a centre square at the death of a really important game as opposed to Luke Parker um, because you, you're you working towards an end game that, that, isn't, that, that isn't now. And I don't think Sydney's team is a premiership contending team this year like that. You know, there's such a spirited side that you, you, could, you could see them pinching one ahead of time potentially. But, yeah, I think their team is still a rebuild – not rebuilding, but it's still a building team. And um, that's why I had them on the, the outskirts of the eight this year or sort of – you know, on the edge of the eight. Um, very, very impressive on their day, but I still think there's that that sort of gap um, between their really good younger players and their senior players, who I think probably unfortunately won't um, be around for the for the next Sydney flag, which I think is coming. Um, unfortunate news about Buddy as well. He's going to miss a, a couple of weeks with a, with a finger. Um, maybe yeah. not as bad as, as first thought, but... Yeah, I just think that their, their core of that team is your, your Mills and your Heaney is your kind of senior players, and then you've got your McInerney and your Florent and your Blakey and um, potentially McDonald. You think McDonald gets a good run over the next couple of weeks now? Like to me, that's the core of the Sydney team, and so I think that's probably that's where it sits for me. Fine, oh, yeah, look, yeah, that's fine. I just think it it was a weird decision in my mind, and it it does make me kind of question. I, I guess like if 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 you, if that's what you if that's what is happening, if what you're saying is happening, mm. then fair enough. I, I think it – I'm not sure that I agree that they can't win the premiership or, I mean, as you say, they could pinch one. I'm, I'm not sure I agree that that's, that's accurate. I think their team's pretty good. So, mm. And I think it's like – but I think it's pretty good if they are like playing everything one in their best positions, not like <laughs> doing weird experiments. Um, but anyway – uh, so I still have them in the top six, I think, um, and maybe top four as well, uh, regardless of a. And 
He just sometimes gets shaky performances against bad teams. Like that just happens oh, yeah. to the, even to all clubs. Um, and like North were, like North aren't a great team, but they're 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 actually a lot better than what they were showing. Like their mm-hmm. talent is better than what they were showing. There was bound to. They, yeah, had to, they had to respond yeah. to, yeah, like, exactly. after being yeah. basically told that they're weak and soft and yeah. pathetic by their coach <laughs> in the media, like, they had to respond. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right, Tom, let's go to uh, the tribunal. Now, we've mm. we've banged on about the tribunal plenty of times. Everyone knows that we don't like it and we think it's pretty inconsistent. But there's a, a bit of a conversation going around there where people are strongly disagreeing with the Paddy Ryder um, decision where he was suspended for two weeks for hip and shouldering uh, Will Day, who will be out for one to two weeks. Well, it's a, it's theoretic. It's it's listed as under the con- concussion protocol, but it's two weeks, so it's obviously mm. also for symptoms. Um, mm. Like he's, he hasn't recovered fully from the concussion. So I... I'm interested to hear your take. I think um, people will be interested to hear as well because I think that we are both probably on the opposite side of, of the general kind of mainstream sentiment. Well, it's it's hard to tell, isn't it? But I, I think that for me we expect, um, you know, these snap decisions to be made at, at such a high pace. You've got no idea, and I don't have any idea, um, what it's like to be out in the footy field in an AFL setting and to see how fast things happen. And that's the first thing players always say when they debut, isn't it? Like, I can't believe how fast it is compared, even compared to, you know, other high levels like the um, under-18s or, or VFL or whatever. So that's the first thing. But I think that when we're talking about issues around concussion, the only way that we will actually get players to stop doing these actions and to train players um, so that they are able to make the right decision in a snap second is to create a punitive um, outcome, which is suspension. And unfortunately for Ryder, you know, he, he didn't want to concuss Will Day, but he, in that snap second, made a decision um, that ended up with day being concussed. And I think just to say, oh, it's too fast or it's too soft or whatever, that's that's actually not solution focused. That's just fobbing the problem off to later. If you want to create a solution whereby we are um, helping players learn more quickly how to make these decisions and what is the right instinctive thing to do, then you have to create a, a negative outcome, a punishment for when you get it wrong. And I think that that's what the AFL is doing. So, yeah, I thought it was fine. I would have been happy if it was one week. Two weeks, I'm not unhappy with either. Um, but, yeah, I think that's what we need to do now. It's just getting more and more serious the more stories you read. Another one in The Guardian the other day that was really harrowing about former footy players suffering with concussion. And um, as far as I'm concerned, this is an unfortunate, necessary step to try and retrain players' brains about what to do in those snap seconds. Yep. Uh, I think, like, the Dangerfield thing last year was the the moment where they said – you know, this is the reality. Like if you go past the ball or you make a decision to to not play the football and you hit somebody and they are concussed or whatever, mm. like knocked out as Jay Kelly was, like you are going to be suspended. Um, and that's that's what happened. I mean, Ryder, Ryder may claim or may have claimed, oh, I was bracing for contact or whatever. But the reality is that he went past the football to do that. And and that means you are going to be suspended. Like it, it doesn't. Mm. You can argue with if you want that the rule is wrong, and I don't think it is wrong because of what you're saying. Like we need to have some kind of you know sacrosanctity, if that is a word, around around the head, and there needs to be protections against concussion. And this is the only way that the AFL has currently to do that. I I mean, there could be better ways out there, but this is the way that the AFL chooses to do it. Um, that's, that is how the rule is interpreted, that if the ball is there and you run past them, past the ball, sorry, I'm opposite screen, then <laughs> you are going to be suspended for hitting a player. And that's that's just yeah. where it is. So, And people say, well, that, you know, the, oh, the game's too soft, like the bump, <clears throat> bump is dead, like, you know, RIP to the bump. Like... Does anyone actually really care? Like, 
honestly. I got so the game has so many other <clears throat> awesome things about it than the better than the goddamn bump. Who gives the, a shit? The knocking somebody out, like yeah, sweet. like well, you can tackle <laughs> still, you can take screamers, you can do what it like. Just don't call anyone the who saw in the head Shia, when they don't have the ball. Like anyone who saw Shy Bolton's goal on the weekend and then sits there and tells me, oh, footy's boring now because yeah. they can't bump each other. Like, what the yeah. hell? I got pissed off at Will Snelling because he tried to bump somebody instead of tackling them on the weekend and like right. just bounced off and kicked a goal. And it's like, just tackle. Like, why would you ever bump a player who has the ball? Anymore, yeah. like it makes no yeah. sense. Anyway, that's a that's a aside, but yeah, it's it's a it's just a dumb conversation, probably made by the same blokes who get on AFLW sites and mm. you know say women's sport sucks. Like it's just Neanderthal. Yeah, um, and maybe the generation, you know, the next generation of footy fans will not care about the bump as much as us and older generations did, and so then it won't actually be yeah, much well, of an issue. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's 10, 20 years. It is dying, isn't it? Like, mm. you really yeah. only see it maybe once around now kind of mm. thing where players actually do it. So, <laughs> and, right. it's, and it's more like just Dermy and shit on the call who really seem to care. Like, no one who actually follows the game seems to care that much. Mm. Very good. All right, Gus. Well, uh, speaking of people that don't follow the game, we've got our reverse shine a light. Uh, I would say this means that we do follow the game. We have to. <laughs> yeah, be, but we just don't dig it. We just don't get them right. Nah. Um, play that sting, spider. <laughs> All right, Gus. Um, so last week I was coming pretty high and mighty off a. A big, a big point, and I went a with point. Jed Buse from Geelong. So, uh, you want to give me the Buse news? Uh, the news is not good. Damn. Um, the Buse news is not good, Tom. Um, mm. Just to to give you a sense, uh, well, there's no sense. He had 11 touches and a goal. Like you're not getting a point for that. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, there's not much to nice. not much else to to kind of get on with. Yep. Um, fair enough. Fair enough, Had kick though, because he occasionally does have those random games where he has 25 touches. But uh, yeah, I picked Hayden Young, who had 21 possessions, four marks. Um, look, he, he had a good game, but the problem, I think, that I and perhaps miss um, just undervalued how good he's been so far this season is that's pretty much just the average. So I don't think we, and he didn't make the best. So I don't think I really should get a point. Yeah. Yeah. Look um, again, a pretty decent pick has been in good form, but we were probably looking for like a career best game or something to uh, get mm. him over the line there. Cause he's still a, a young gun. Um, all right. This week, Gus. Uh, for me, I'm going to go with a dude. And I actually think like, funnily enough, could potentially at one point be on our on the outeries. He's just on the watch list. He's just on the watch list at the moment. Uh, Jared Leinert from mm. St Kilda, who came over from Port Adelaide, always seemed to produce when he played for Port Adelaide, but like just couldn't nail down a spot in the team. But has been very good for St Kilda as sort of a, a, a secondary intercept defender who can also, you know, like run off. And, yeah, I, I've, I think he's been good. So Jared Leinart for me. Uh, and I'm yeah. probably saying his name pretty poorly, but, um, yeah. Leinart, I think, yeah, it's pretty Leinart. close. Um, I was very close to picking him mm. um, because I agree with you. I think he's... Um, yeah, he's good. He seems to do the Considering job. Considering he was nearly out of the AFL like four weeks ago, he just has to have a pretty yeah. good, a, a reasonable game. And I get a point. <laughs> so, all right. Um, this week, I have got. I need to get myself a green screen. You see? No, there you go. Oh yeah. Do you know who that is? Uh, Hayden McLean. Hayden McLean. God, I am. Um, uh, <laughs> I am good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really impressed with myself that I nailed that. <laughs> that Justin, Big H. Is that Justin McInerney in, on the left? It's Josh, Josh Kennedy, isn't it? Josh or is Ken- McInerney. I don't know. I don't know. 12 or. It's, yeah, I this is captivating for our podcast only listeners. This is why you should sign up to YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I think McLean is a good player. I rate him 
Um, it was, it was Errol Gould. It was Errol Goulden. Oh, Goulden. Yeah. No yeah. I rate McLean very highly. I think, um, you know, he's got a lot of assets. He's a very good mark. He's kicking action when he, you watch him kick for goal is p- absolutely pure. Like it's really, really nice to watch. And uh, I think he, he kicked two goals last week, didn't get a lot of the ball, um, but I think with Buddy out this week, he might get a bit more opportunity as, you know, Sydney's... Well, they might um, actually kick in the ball, so... They might kick in the ball, That would be a yeah. good start. That would be a start, absolutely. Yeah. And they're playing West Coast, so I think, you know, obviously McGovern's been in sensational form. I don't know whether um, Barras will go to him or McGovern or one of the other sort of third-tour guys, depends on who else is down there for the Swans, if they bring a Marty or... McDonald in, but yeah, I think McLean. I, I just really like him as a player, and I think he's uh, set for a, a good week. No, he's a good player. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, it's it's hard to tell with tall forwards, obviously, because like they are so dependent on being the ball, having the ball kicked to them. But yeah, it is amazing how often the Swans kick the ball to to Buddy, and then like the very few occasions they kick it to McLean, he seems to do something good. So, Mm. yeah, uh, I think he's a good player. All right, Tom, let's finish off the show. Thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, If you want to get in touch with us, you can hit us up on any of our social channels or we're on the outer one at gmail.com. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, give us a give us a subscribe on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on the podcast. Um, also, go to YouTube and give us a subscribe because that's what we really care about now, uh, as evidenced by the stuff before. Um, Tom's green screen. You got to catch that, guys. Mm. <clears throat> uh, if you are enjoying the show, please like rate, review, subscribe, as I said, um, so more people can see it because, yeah, we like doing the show, but we we really want to get it out to as many people as we can. Uh, anything else, Tom? No, just uh, tune in for our tipping show, um, which will be coming up um, sometime in the next 24 hours. Obviously, there's a few big games this week spread out right from Thursday to Monday. So, um, yeah, you want to be across all that. And the best way to do that is to watch our tips. So uh, tune in. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Ciao. Ciao.